Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Stephen Batchelor, who is an author of several books on Buddhism, often from a secular perspective. He also runs regular retreats around the world with his wife, Martine. However, he's here to talk to us today about his interest in photography and collage and how he sees this as an integrative practice in his life. We'll then go on to talk about the importance of the arts in general as a medium of expression and communication and how this can relate to the middle way. Stephen? Welcome to the MWS podcast. Thank you, Barry. Very glad to be here. Okay, so um, to start off, have you you always been creative? Um, Were you encouraged to be creative as a child? Um, Yes, probably yes. Um, Maybe not in so many words, but I grew up um, with a strong awareness of my great uncle who had died two or three years before I was born. And he was uh, both a sculptor and uh, a photographer Uh and um, so you know he was the sort of a bit of a black sheep of the family Um, but I rather admired him from a young age I liked the fact that he uh, had broken away from convention and had taken the risk uh, to be an artist and to to do that had actually emigrated to the US Um, my mother also uh, I grew up as a single child um, with my mother and she too had had a strong interest in the arts as a young woman, and so um, both my brother and I were brought up in a, in a family that had a not necessarily an explicit but a, 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 an implicit valuation of the arts and the creative process. Yeah. Okay. And was it your uncle that um, had an influence on you actually choosing photography over other visual arts? Uh, probably not, um, because I. Actually, while I was a child, I never actually saw any of his photographs. Um, I only saw those more recently. But um, I honestly don't quite know what it was that uh, pushed me in the direction of photography. I I can't recall uh, very clearly. Um, uh, We did have a family business at that time, too, which was uh, photo engraving. It's a very old-fashioned way of producing uh, plates for printing pictures in newspapers. Yeah. I sometimes used to work there in the summer as a kid, and I used to work in the photography studio there. Um, so I was kind of grew up in that milieu, let's say, and um, I can't point to what, any one single event or experience that sort of moved me towards photography, but I suspect, you know, from uh, a general sense of the conditions under which I lived, it was not an unusual or unlikely thing to have wanted to do. Okay. I described it as an interest. Is it an interest or a passion? I think at the beginning, uh, when I was like 16 or so, it was uh, probably more a passion and uh, a vocation, actually. Yeah. Because when I I did my A-levels at grammar school in Watford, I had already a place at the Regent Street Polytechnic, as it was then, uh, to do a uh, two, three year course in uh, professional photography. So uh, that was clearly where I was going. But the I did so badly at my A-levels that I failed to get the required number to be accepted in the course. And so then I went off to, to India for a gap year that lasted 13 years. And I came back as a Buddhist monk. And so my whole career as a photographer was derailed by Buddhism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't really pick up a camera again until I went to South Korea uh, to train as a Zen monk. And why did you actually pick it up? Again, it's a good question. I don't really know. Um, I am aware of the fact that throughout my time as a Tibetan Buddhist monk, uh, the arts in general were broadly uh, discouraged. Um, it wasn't seen to be a particularly important thing to do. Uh, There were some of us monks who wanted to continue playing musical instruments. That wasn't allowed, um, and so on and so forth. And also, I think I really did accept that view that the arts were a distraction from enlightenment. 
And so I really didn't do anything in that period. But when I went to Korea, one of the reasons I went was because I became aware of how all the Buddhist traditions, the the Zen Chan uh, in Korea, they call it Son Buddhism, yeah. um, did not have a problem with the arts, as we know. I mean, we have yeah. the beautiful Zen calligraphies and uh, paintings and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, many of the monks in the monastery in South Korea uh, did some form of artistic work, be it tea ceremony, be it painting, be it uh, whatever. Yeah. And, um, and that was a very conducive environment for my pursuing my interest in photography. So I brought a little, a tiny little Rolle 35 millimeter. Yeah. Camera and I took a lot, lots of photographs. And I really began to get into that medium again. Do you think when you um, were very involved in the Tibetan tradition, was that something that you felt was missing in some way? And um, as, you, as you say, did that play a part? Was that a significant part in your um, in your interest in in Zen? Yeah, it was actually. Um, but the, my interest in Zen and my frustration with the Tibetan traditions um, was, in a sense. Uh, sort of revolving around these issues. Um, to me, any tradition that uh, veers towards the do more dogmatic end of the spectrum is unlikely to encourage uh, creativity or imagination. In other words, they don't, it's not the sort of thing they want people to do, to think for themselves or to come up with, say, you know, original artistic ideas. That simply doesn't fit with a view of the world that basically describes how reality is, and claims that uh, its teachings have a are a path that constitutes a way out of the dilemma of samsara. And if photography and art and creativity are not included in that path, then they're obviously of no value at all. Yeah. Um, whereas in Zen, it's rather different. OK. Do you think then that the arts play a big role in helping us to tolerate ambiguity? Um, possibly. Uh, I'm not quite thought of it in those terms before, but certainly I, well, let's just, art, the arts is a little bit too grand. Let's just stick to what I do, photography and more latterly film and, and collage. Yeah. Um, I think um, by learning to look uh, acutely and alertly and with an open mind through a viewfinder of a camera, um, uh, is, is a device that helps us to look at the world more honestly. And in terms of uh, photography, of course, we're doing more than just looking at the world. We're actually trying to configure it, what configure what we see into what we would consider a work of art. Yeah. Uh, in other words, to transcend a simple um, you know, recording of an image, as one would in, say, a snapshot, and actually seeking through the medium of the camera to transform what we're seeing into something other, something else. Right. And that to me is central to my whole engagement with the arts, is how we, um, uh, how we transform perception, how we take the raw materials of the world yeah. and turn them into something that is greater than just the sum of details that we happen to be uh, perceiving with our eyes in that moment. Okay, yeah. and then when did um, collage come in, into the picture? Collage? Um, well, uh, there was a continuity because uh, my photography was increasingly turning to um, pay to take photographs of things that you would otherwise not notice. Yeah. In other words, I, I was less and less interested in taking photographs of things that are visually somehow um, standing out. Uh, you know, like people will see a beautiful sunset and they'll all raise their cameras up and photograph the sunset because the sunset is wow, such a beautiful thing, or rainbows and stuff like that. Uh, instead, um, and again, this I think is very much in keeping with the Zen approach, is to turn one's attention to the ordinary details of your daily life that you tend to overlook and just sort of bl blank out as boring and uninteresting, but by heightening attention on the ordinary, you begin to uncover visually a sense of how extraordinary those simple things can be. So yeah. some of those fascinating, or so not fascinating, but some of those satisfying photographs I've taken have been a very mundane things, but seen through, uh, seen in such a way that they transcend their ordinariness 
and uh, reveal something which is uh, um, out of the ordinary. Yeah, well, this ties in with your an expression I've heard you use, the, the everyday sublime. Yeah, that's right. Well, the everyday sublime is my way of talking about how um, through meditation in particular, and also through Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist thought, um, we sort of deconstruct our habitual patterns of perception and our habitual sort of internal narrative and learn to still, still our minds and stop. And as we do that, I think the world opens up in not only... Uh, the world opens up not just as something more, more clear or vivid, but somehow also um, as something more beautiful. Yeah. I think there's, a, the, there's an aesthetic dimension to insight, mm -hmm. uh, just as there is an affective dimension and a cognitive dimension. But I'm not really aware of many, if any Buddhist texts, that really address the aesthetics of meditation. And so uh, my interest in photography, collage, and so on, is very much uh, has to be seen in the aspect of the aesthetics of spiritual experience. Uh, the aesthetics of Buddhist experience, the aesthetics of, of insight, if you wish. And I call that the everyday sublime. In other words, to experience the world from the perspective of, let's say, uh, the four tasks that I speak of, of embracing dukkha and letting go of craving and stopping and then cultivating a, um, a way of life. That, If we look at the world through that in, in that way, I feel that uh, it does awaken uh, an aesthetic uh, appreciation. And at the same time, therefore, um, the baddies in Buddhism, greed, hatred, egoism, and so on, I think we can begin to understand as being, as being an aesthetic, an aesthetics. Yeah. They numb us, they dull us. They don't just make us more confused and give us rise to lots of suffering, although they might do that. But one of the other consequences of living in a world determined by those uh, drives is that the world is rendered opaque and flat and uninteresting. Yeah. And so the arts, I think, to me, work very much as a practice of embracing dukkha, embracing the totality of our life condition, but in a way that's particularly alert uh, to the uh, to to its aesthetic. Okay, um, just back to to you specifically working with um, collage and photography. You use the term found objects. Um, is, yeah. is that does that relate to what you're saying? Yeah, it does. You see, I I began I began to realise when I was taking photographs of just ordinary things from funny angles or whatever that um, what I was uh, valuing were the things that I found. Right, yeah. Um, in other words, things that I just stumbled across, I saw out of the corner of my eye or whatever. Yeah, okay. So there's something about a photograph that it is a found object already. And the collage, though, um, that I can remember when that process began. Um, it goes back, in fact, to a, a very vivid memory I have when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And I had, in those days, we used to have these ring fold binders we used to keep our papers in at school. And in one of those ring fold binders, I, I, I just cut up a lots of di different bits of magazines and stuff and, and arranged them inside the, the, the clear plastic cover of the folder uh, in, in a form of collage. And I found that, although I was doing it in a, in a, I can't remember my motives, but I was very, very satisfied and fascinated with the result. And I could, that's a very, very key moment in my, in my upbringing. And I didn't do collage until, boom, maybe 30 years later when I was actually, and what triggered it was a trip I made to London with my brother and my mother in 19, July 1975, July 1995. Yeah. And I was sitting in the train going back to Devon where I lived at the time. And I was emptying out my pockets. Uh, of all the stuff that we'd kind of accumulated over that weekend, you know, th theatre tickets and a little program for an art gallery and the Sunday paper and whatever it was. And it suddenly struck me that this was what would generally be seen as rubbish, stuff you would just chuck away, stick in a garbage bin or whatever. And I don't know why, but it occurred to me, well, maybe I could transform this rubbish into an object of beauty, much in the same way as I would transform an ordinary object lying on the street into hopefully a good photograph. Yeah. And so when I got home back to Devon, 
um, I started playing around with this idea. I started cutting out, I started glued these bits of stuff onto card, uh, started cutting them up, playing around with them. And that really was uh, the beginning of a process that uh, continues up until uh, today. I mean, I'm still mm -hmm. doing this. Uh, it's, it's moved on an awful lot, but the basic idea has remained the same. It's working with the detritus of the world and uh, transforming how we uh, relate to it, rather than as useless rubbish, yes. is actually something that is potentially uh, a work of art, work, a work of beauty. Do you feel, in a sense, when you're creating a collage, that you're you're sculpting? Yeah, there's definitely an element in well, that, that, that uh, in collage that uh, brings my my hands and my body into an engagement with the practice, and that. I feel as, a, as an intellectual, as a writer, um, uh, you tend to get rather lost in your head. And uh, working with collage, and ditto with photography. Photography, again, is very much a very physical relationship with the environment. Yeah. And uh, collage, likewise. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely drawn to the, the, the textures of the materials I work with, the way they actually feel between my fingers. I often literally physically caress with the fingers the surfaces of my work. Uh, I find that deeply uh, uh, satisfying. I don't know why. It's all the crazy, really. But um, uh, that's just how it goes. And so it brings my... I can actually feel it in my hands. Yeah. Uh, the, the working with the materials, the cutting of the materials, the gluing of the materials. This does two things. It takes me out of my head. Yeah. In other words, it's not something that's uh, conceptually even really intelligible. That's why it's so difficult to talk about. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, you know, you have to see the work. And I, 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 I can't really... Sh we, we decided we wouldn't try and show the work. Yeah. But that's another story. But um, it, it certainly uh, has that function of uh, bringing one's whole uh, physical relationship with the environment into what, for me, is an extension of my practice of the Dharma. Yeah. Um, um, there are various tensions in art, for example, representation versus expressivism or regulation versus freedom. How, how do you navigate these polarities in your work? Well, representation is something that I seek to move away from. And um, in that regard, I think I was influenced by the work of my brother, David, um, uh, who's uh, quite a well-known artist. He just had a show open in Bristol uh, this weekend. I was there. Uh, called Flatlands. It's a plug, David, it's a plug, plug. <laughs> um, and um, so it, I was very much, uh, 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 when I got the idea of non-representational art, in other words, the picture is not there to represent something that is not, but the picture somehow uh, it, it has an autonomy and a value in its own right. You're actually just looking at the surface and the material and the stuff of the of the image itself. Uh, that was a sort of revelation to me when that penny finally dropped. Yeah. And so that helped me very much um, in uh, working with collage as a kind of parallel process, a corollary, as it were, of my written work. Mm. And so collage becomes um, a kind of uh, silent commentary, or, yes, yeah, silent commentary on what I write. And I keep it very much to myself. I don't show my work, but it's like writing is a form of composition. It's about putting words and sentences and paragraphs together. And also it's an aesthetic process because at some point you say, yes, that sentence really does follow that sentence. It sounds good. It yeah, sounds yeah. right. It's, it's, got a, it's agreeable in some way. So there is an aesthetic dimension to that, but it's still very much a, a conceptual process. So it's, it's trying to find you know, the most effective you working of a certain argument to make a point. Now, with, once you take words and concepts out of the story and you're just working with colours, as I am, colour bits of paper, and organising them together, you are doing so on a far more intuitive level. And I can't explain this, but I feel that my writing is, uh, is, is, is actually just 50%, 50% of the creative process that's actually going on in the course of composing a book. Oh, interesting. The rest is, 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 is collage as a rule, or film or whatever, but mainly, mainly collage. Yeah, okay. Um, do you think you can communicate, well, we've been talking about this, but the idea that you can communicate things to yourself and others through art that, that you can't do through other mediums? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, Henry Moore was once asked, um, you know, what does this statue mean? Uh, you know, what's it about? And he said, well, if I could answer that question, I wouldn't have had to make the statue. Right. In other words, uh, and this is, I've heard other uh, variants on that response, because artists are often asked that. And um, it, if you could put it into words, what you're trying to communicate through art, you wouldn't have to do the art. It's as simple as that. <laughs> and the, um, the art has the, to me, great uh, strength of not relying upon um, <clears throat> discursive thought, of not relying upon um, it, it, it having a clear-cut meaning that some clever person can then define, in other words. And, and in that sense, it transcends um, uh, the limits of what can be stated, what can be uh, you know, defined. And it uh, speaks, I think, from a more holistic, if we can use that word, uh, a quality of experience. We're actually, when I'm through a painting or through a photograph or through a film, uh, I feel I'm able to say something yeah. uh, that uh, brings more, and how do you say it? I can say something more effectively than I could possibly communicate it in words. But even I can't say what it is I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how does this all relate to... Um your understanding of the middle way? Um, well, uh, this is where it gets a little bit tricky without actually being able to show you the work itself. But um, collage, I don't just sort of cut pieces of paper up and bits of card and bits of plastic and then just sort of glue them willy-nilly willy onto a piece of card. Uh, I follow a very, very um, uh, formulaic um, uh, principles of organisation of the material. Yeah. And uh, that brings into play a tension between um, between chance and uh, an order, or randomness and order. Yeah. In other words, the materials are random. They're not things I buy or go out to get. They're things I find. There's a, the element of chance there. Yeah. Um, it's just what I'll stumble across. Um, but there's very much an element of order and control in the way that these found objects are arranged and they're arranged on grid patterns a bit like mosaics and um, they're cut in uh, particular ways that follow certain I suppose if I were a mathematician there's probably some algorithms at work somewhere but I don't think mathematically I find that the organizing uh, structures of my work uh, actually come to me as I'm thinking in pictures I know that might sound strange that um, uh, many of the key moves in the development of my collage art have come to me almost as sort of epiphanies I've seen in my mind, uh, you know, where the thing is going next. And it's very difficult to describe what's going on there. But um, uh, that's, in a sense, the, the sort of dynamic, the, the, the element of chance which seems to trigger and perpetuate uh, a particular sense of structure and order. Now, part of that structure, and so I'm getting to your point, don't worry, uh, <laughs> part of that structure has to do with a rather firm insistence on, um, on the principle of identity and difference. In other words, one of my rules is I never put two pieces um, of uh, material together. Uh, I, I never let two pieces of material that are identical touch so let's give me an example. I have a huge, I have a large work about 70 centimeters square, yeah. uh, composed of, 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 of what, about 1,024 white squares. Yeah. Um, and those uh, white, 1,024 white squares are cut, are cut ups of uh, 81 pieces of found white paper. Yeah. Now, when you're walking down the street, and you see a piece of white paper, you just say, oh, there's a piece of white paper. Oh, there's another piece of white paper. Oh, there's another piece of white paper. And you get them all together. And when you start putting them side by side, you realize that none of them are the same. They, in other words, they, they, they somehow illuminate uh, the tension between things we would conventionally say, oh, they're, and they're the same. They're both white. Mm. And yet when you put them next to each other, you realize, well, actually, they're not the same. They're different. Yeah. They're both the same and different, in other words. Yeah. So it, what I'm playing with is this 
sameness and difference. Now, this is, of course, a, a key argument in Madhyamaka philosophy, that things do not have inherent existence because they are not identical or different from other things. The categories of identity and difference are incapable of capturing the contingency, the fluidity, the, um, the emergence and the uh, unfolding of life itself. So at some level, although this might sound terribly abstract, um, I'm trying to somehow play with the tension between identity and difference that somehow helps uh, reveal the world as not reducible to our classical uh, you know, linguistic categories, such as those of identity and difference. Uh, and that, of course, is the way of looking at shunyata, which is, of course, the middle way. Yeah. OK. Um, all right, I've got a question now from um, Richard Flanagan. Oh, Richard Flanagan. Hello, Rich. How are you doing? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you feel that engaging in photography can challenge existing assumptions one might have about a potential subject, be it an object, place or person? Can you think of any examples from your experience? Um, yeah, I can think of a very good example. Most of the, the, pho the, the, the photographs that are on my website, and which you might be showing on this video, I don't know, are actually reflections. And um, what I, uh, I started becoming very, very interested in reflected light, uh, and our, especially our urban environments. When you walk down a high street, um, you're at, when you're walking by a bunch of shops, for example, you're actually seeing a double world, but you edit out one. When you look into the shop window, you might see you know, whatever it is, radios or shoes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're also seeing, but editing out, the reflection of the street behind. It's just, just, it's just as visual. It's just as present, but we edit it out because that it's not useful, if you like. If you want to buy a pair of shoes, you want to get a clear look at the pair of shoes. You don't want to switch your um, uh, focus to the point where you see the people walking beside you on the pavement. Now, um, I found this somewhat of a revelation that... If you are photographing into a reflective surface, you're actually seeing two things. You're seeing the surface and you're seeing what's reflected in it. And if you push it further, everything is a ref all imagery is reflected light. Mm -hmm. It's light bouncing off the image. If that image, if that surface is, is shiny enough, then it actually reveals images of, uh, of its own. And when I started, when I started to train myself to notice this, rather than ignore it and just focus on the shoes or the radios in the shop. And my whole visual world sort of, in a sense, sort of became, was doubled yeah. instantly. And I actually went through a long period of forcing myself to notice the reflected um, sort of shadow world, if you like, that is present all around us, that we edit out. And then, and again, it even surprised me initially, that you could photograph this shadowed world. And if you play with the depth of field, which I do a lot, you know about depth of field, it has to do with the um, aperture. If you photograph at a, at a high aperture number like F16 or F22, you get a very deep depth of field. So it means that you can um, get both images in focus. You can get the shoes and the people on the street walking by equally in focus because you've got an extended depth of field. So you start realizing you're actually photographing a double world. And um, uh, and the camera can capture that much more accurately than the human brain. The human brain is, is an editing machine. In many yeah. ways, it's designed to sort of highlight what we want and what we don't like and what's dangerous. A camera doesn't have those interests. Mm -hmm. Camera just the machine. But uh, Cartier-Bresson, who's one of the great photographers, uh, called a camera an instrument of intuition and spontaneity. <laughs> it's not the sort of idea you would tend to think of when you pick up a great big Nikon. But um, he's absolutely right. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it, it sort of takes you out of your brain in a weird way, and it becomes a device whereby to experience the world anew. Yeah. Now, to me, I'm, I, I, I'm very also very much taken by the idea that the purpose of art is not to present something that's beautiful, but it is to force us to see the world in a new way, in a way we haven't yet done. Right. 
And so the photographs that I, the series of photographs I did of reflections, of which I took hundreds and hundreds of shots, shot, of shots, is about 35 on the website. Yep. Um, all of these, uh, um, and people say, oh, you photoshopped it. No, 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 I meant that they are, they're whizzy. What you, they are just single shots on silver, you know, um, chemical film, not digital or anything like yep. that. Um, and, um, so the um yeah the uh, the photograph therefore forces you to realize you could you know there are other ways of looking at the world than you are habitually um prejudiced to do so and this of course again has resonances with buddhism yeah we tend to see the world determined by our egoism our attachments our fears our aversions and so on and that actually locks our sense of the world into place and what renders it as i've already mentioned very often rather dull and uninteresting. I think the two go hand in hand. Okay. Photography is a means whereby to somehow break through that rigidity of, um, of visual conditioning, uh, to open up the world as far richer and far more ambiguous, as you said earlier. Yeah. And it, had, uh, it, 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 on, it superficially appears. So it is about opening up ambiguity. In other words, that too is whittling away at the idea that you know, what you, you know, things are the way they appear. Mm. It's breaking that down. It's again revealing that things are empty of any inherent self-existence, as the Prasangika Madhyamaka people say. And um, so all of these elements come together. And um, that would be one example of how photography has come to uh, come to change the world for me. Okay. Change the way I see the world. Now you um you say yep. Uh... You, you show your photographs, but you don't tend to show your collage. Why is that? Well, the pro one problem is that a, a photograph is an, a, di a, di a digitizable image yeah. that can then be reproduced quite you know, reasonably well uh, on a computer screen uh, or it can be printed out. But these collages um, are not reducible just to the visual image. They can't be digitalized. I could take photographs of them, but what you would you would miss too much yeah I see. you would miss the textures you see one of the things that really really draws me is uh, is, is is the way in which materials get distressed you know what i mean it's good i could really love a piece of paper that's been run over by a car a dozen times in the middle of the street or something that's been torn or something that's been somebody scribbled on or something that somebody's crumpled up and thrown away yeah i love the texturing and the distressing that comes with just you know unconscious naive usage of materials. So I then flatten them out, glue them, but I'm really in love with the textures. And the textures, of course, also affect the way light reflects off the whole image. So when I look at my collages, I look at them from different light angles to catch the different reflective um, functions of the different materials and how they all go together. And you can't do that you can't represent that uh, photographically. Photographically, you wouldn't even realize it was a collage. You'd think it was just a, an abstract painting of mosaic or whatever. Yeah, but if a, an opportunity arose to exhibit in a gallery, would you be open to that? Probably. Um, I wouldn't go out of my way to arrange it myself. Yeah. Um, uh, no way. But if somebody decided that would like to do that, I would probably cooperate. Yeah, okay. Uh, right, my next question, again from someone you know, J uh, Julian Adkins. Oh, Julian. Hi, Julian. And he Up would like... Edinburgh, huh? That's right, from Edinburgh, yeah. And he would like to know if there are any artists or genres within the Zen or Tibetan Buddhist traditions with which you feel a particular affinity. Affinity. Um, well, to be quite frank, I find that uh, a, a, a Tibetan Buddhist art and Zen Buddhist art, by and large, um, has got stuck in pretty much a formalistic dead end, if I'm really blunt. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't mean that I don't find some of these works very beautiful and, and very moving, actually. But um, as, a, as a means of uh, advancing my own creative, imaginative life, I don't find them particularly helpful. And although, uh, I mean, you know that the Tibetan paintings are all done on grids, all done according to very exact proportions, which leaves, you know, relatively little room for the genius of the artist to find expression through them. Although, you know, there are 
I can, there are definitely brilliantly beautiful tankers and, you know, run of the mill ones. Uh, same in Zen, the, when you see these sort of calligraphies, which look as though they've just been dashed off in a few seconds, which they have, yeah. they've been done according to a very, very formal uh, constraint. And I suppose in some ways my work does mirror that tension between the constraints of form and the possibilities of chance. But I feel that the forms that traditional Buddhist cultures have evolved over hundreds of years um, have kind of reached, as, I think they've got as far as they can go. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not, I, I, when people say, oh, Buddhist art, and then they think of tankas or Zen calligraphy, um, I think that's a, a very poor way of understanding what Buddhist art could be for our time. Yeah. And I think that a Buddhist practice or a Buddhist a community uh, comes alive aesthetically by expressing itself in forms that are not just copying the styles of Tibet or Korea or Japan, but are actually um, uh, bringing their insights, their understanding, their sensibility that they've cultivated through their practice into forms of express expressivity and articulation that are more uh, rooted in our own uh, Western traditions of the uh, plastic arts, creative arts. Yep. Okay. Um... Then um, Norma Smith um, asks, uh, do you have a, a message to communicate to viewers uh, via the photos you take and the collages you assemble, or do you wish us to discover our own message? Uh, yeah, I don't really have. Um, I think as soon as you make art uh, subordinate to uh, communicating a religious truth, mm -hmm. Um, you have compromised the autonomy and the integrity of the art. And um, so to that extent, I'm not using my art as a vehicle for somehow um, uh, covertly, um, uh, you know, communicating Buddhist values. So because of my Buddhist practice and my interests and so on, obviously they do at some, you know, they can be explained as I have been explaining them in those terms. But the beauty of the, of the great thing about the work of art is that it doesn't come with a, with a, with a, a you know, a, 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 a mission statement attached. Uh, the work works for you or it doesn't. It'll have an effect on some people. Other people will be completely unmoved by it. And in that sense, I want to honor the autonomy of the work. Yeah. Uh, in doing so, um, uh, I'm not actually interested in what people think of it or make of it or or anything. I'm, I'm just interested in, in, our, in, in, in showing uh, this part of my life, being vulnerable about that, yeah. um, uh, but much in the same way as I publish books. Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking to, um, to us today, Stephen. It's been, been fascinating. Okay. Well, thank you, Barry. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.